Welcome to Drinking the Kool-Aid. Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. And today's story is gonna... Oh, oh. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> we don't typically laugh at the beginning of these, so I'm... I'm all right. What's happening? This might sound a little familiar okay. to you. To me? To you. Okay. Okay, so when you were telling your story... Okay. A squirrel cage. Okay. I just was, like, really into Jake Bird. Yes! <laughs> yes! No! Did you really do this? Yeah. Oh, my God, Lord! <laughs> Dude! So, I Dude. was like, I have to know more. Dude! I was so, so hoping you would cover it, but I did yeah. not expect you to do it right after. <gasps> yeah. I was, okay. like... Typing, 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 and researching. <laughs> Hold up. Okay, okay, okay. I am yeah. so excited for this. Okay. Um. Ah! He's actually very difficult to research because you don't know the truth and what stories yep. actually belong to him. Yep. So I'm going to give it my best shot. Okay. And uh, he's, of course, also known as the Tacoma Axe Murderer. Oh my god, I'm so excited for this. And I did listen to a podcast called True Crime All the Time. That and it was really fancy. good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they did a great job covering it, so I did get some information from there and then, like, a lot of history sites. Okay. So Jake Bird was born on December 14th, 1901, and he said he grew up, quote, Somewhere out in Louisiana where there ain't no post office. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. where we're starting. <laughs> uh, he left home at the age of 19, and he never really stayed anywhere too long. Uh, he would sneak into train cars and would hop off right before the train got into town. And then he would trade like a day's work for a warm meal and somewhere to sleep for the night. And then he'd be back on the train the next day. Okay. Uh, he also worked as, and I've never heard this before, he worked as a Gandhi dancer. Nope. Ooh. I have no clue. <laughs> yeah, so it is a railroad maintenance worker. Oh, okay. Yeah. but I just, Oh, I suppose that makes sense. It does, but I really like that, a Gandhi dancer. It sounds, it's, you know, it's right up there with like a candy striper. It's like super, just cool sounding. Yes. Like, doesn't relate, though. You know what I mean? Yeah, It absolutely. just, it, like, I mean, it does to an extent, obviously. I uh -huh. don't call it that. But, like, it just, when you f hear that name, that's not what you would expect. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> On July 11th, when Jake was just 24 years old, uh, his new friend died. So he was traveling the rails, and he met 18-year-old Gordon Geiger and 18-year-old James Burwald. The three young men were riding on top of a train, and a rail agent climbed up there, and then a fight broke out. On top of the train? On top of the train. What? Oh, um, oh man. Okay. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm sure we can assume that the three boys were not paying to be on right, the train. Right. Uh, so, James Burwald got away, and then Jake Bird was struck many times. Gordon Geiger was thrown off the train and fell in between two cars. Oh, no. And so as the train started up again, oh, Gordon's no. right leg and left hand were crushed. Oh, no. I can't imagine how I awful I, that I, is. I know. Uh, he actually had to go to the hospital and get a blood transfusion, but he died on the operating what? table. Okay. Yeah. So, Fine, then. Super traumatic. Uh, Jake Bird insisted that he wanted to see justice for his friend Gordon. So he stayed in the area to make sure that he could testify in court. He was offered free lodging at a jail. Oh, no way. <laughs> what? Um, which is just hilarious. Dude, no, thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, that's what he said. So this was a jail in Wahoo, Nebraska. And he was like, no, I think it might be too hot in there for me. <laughs> so pass. 
Instead, he decided to settle in Omaha and he looked for a job, but things went bad fast. Uh oh. Right? Oh, God. <laughs> J.W. Blackman, age 74, was discovered by his son on November 18th. His son believed that his father was just sleeping. Oh, no! But noticed he wasn't moving. So the son lifted the blanket and saw that his father was covered in blood. (gasps) This poor child. I know. J.W.'s head had been beaten in while he was sleeping, and a bloody axe was found near a woodpile. The next day, on November 19th, Wallow Resso arrived home from work and found his wife, 21-year-old Gertrude's bloody body, lying on their bed. Well, okay, so he's moving fast. Yes. Wowza. Uh Uh-huh. Wallow ran through the house screaming and found out that his sister-in-law, 18-year-old Creta Brown, was also murdered. Jeez. So Gertrude had been choked and beaten to death, and Krita had been gagged and her head was beaten in. Okay, these are brutal. Really wow. nasty. Wow. Now the Rasos had two sons, nine-month-old Melvin and three-year-old Robert, but they were unharmed and okay. sleeping would... in their cribs. Ooh, man, yeah. I was holding my breath <laughs> Gotta over here. Gotta get there fast, like they were unharmed. According to the newspapers, a bloody handprint was <gasps> smeared across Melvin's face, though. Oh, ew, 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 ew. Yeah, not a fan of that. Ew. I know that the newspapers, I mean, just like the media, made things sound different than they really were. So I don't know about this, but if it's true... It was out there somewhere, so, yeah. County Attorney Beale said, quote, It is without question the foulest murder I have ever come in contact with in my 10 years as prosecutor in Douglas County. By the next morning, someone else had been attacked. Holy shit, dude! And that's why it's like, if these were all Jake, oh my goodness. Well, I mean, I feel like it would be real coincidental if... If it's not, if it's not when right. he was just staying there. Right. And typically he had always been on a train, not staying put. Right. I agree. It is a coincidence. So 25-year-old, and this is where you had talked about this story. Uh, 25-year-old Harold Stribling and his wife oh, were attacked no. around 3 a.m. in their home. Uh, Harold had been beaten in the head with an axe. He had skull fractures with a deep depression or dent. His wife suffered a blow to her face, and she had a small fracture in her nasal bone with a cut. Uh, The cut went from her forehead to her left eye. Did you uh, look at the pictures of, like, them after? No. There is a picture that I found while I was looking at the um, squirrel cage pictures that is a picture of the striblings. Um, after the attack, and it is crazy. Like, it's a picture of them, and, like, I don't know if it's the hospital, but... Yeah. It's right after recovery, for sure. Sometimes the pictures scare me, so I stay away from them. <laughs> oh, well, now I'm gonna make you look after this, Okay. So. I guess since they survived that one, I can look. Right. So Mrs. Stribling actually pleaded with the intruder for about an hour and begged him to leave their 16-month-old baby alone. The intruder agreed, but forced Mrs. Stribling to leave with him. They walked a few miles together, and then he released her around 6 a.m. Holy shit, she was walking? Uh Uh-huh. After being attacked? Yeah. Whoa, this woman! Mm Mm-hmm. I agree. On November 23rd, Jake Bird was arrested and was taken to the hospital where Mrs. Stribling was recovering. Police say that she hysterically exclaimed, That's the man! Take him away! That was good. (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) But other witnesses say she actually did not identify him immediately and requested that he come back at a later time so she can look at him again. Okay. So that's why I kept saying the intruder, because... We don't actually know for sure right. that it was Jake. 
I mean, I definitely think it's plausible, though, that if you are in shock, you're not going to, like, immediately... You know, it's, it is possible that you're not going to immediately recognize them. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're on painkillers and all sorts of stuff, your brain's not functioning at a normal rate. Right. You know? Jake was convicted and charged to 30 years in prison for the attack, and this is when he went to Squirrel Cage Jail. Ayo! But he was released in 1941 for good behavior after serving 12 years. Oh, well, see, you just I answered your it. own question yep. from, from when we did <laughs> the Squirrel Cage. Yeah, I found it. <laughs> Jake maintained that he was innocent the whole time, and... Several officers testified on his behalf, stating he didn't fit the initial description that was given to the police. Oh. Right. So that's interesting. That is really strange. Because this specific case really has been pinned on him. Right. But who knows? The police also received several reports and letters from people saying Jake might not be the guilty one. He was never charged with the first murders of J.W. Blackman, Mrs. Russell, or Creta Brown. And Jake was arrested again in Michigan in February of 1943 after multiple burglaries. Wow, he's on a roll. Yeah. And he was sentenced to four and a half to five years and then was paroled on August 27th of 1946. On October 30th, 1947, when Jake was 45 years old, he stopped at the home of Bertha Clutt and her daughter, Beverly June, around 2 a.m. Both ladies worked at a local bakery, and he went inside the house and hacked them to death oh my. with an axe. Oh, my. Yeah. The neighbors heard the women screaming, no. and they called the police. Oh. When two officers arrived at 2.30 a.m., Jake took off running barefoot and crashed through a picket fence. After scaling several backyard fences, the police were able to corner him in an alley, and then he started attacking them. Whoa! Right. Dude! He slashed the hand of one officer and stabbed the other in the shoulder. Officer Sabutis was a former prize fighter known as Tiny Lamar, and he was <laughs> able to hit Jake with a left hook to the jaw, and then he kicked him in the groin. Yes! <laughs> Go this dude that I'm not even going to try to repeat the name of. Okay. <laughs> when other officers entered the crime scene, they found Bertha Clutt, age 52, dead in her bedroom, and her head was nearly severed due to a blow to the throat, and she had multiple head injuries. He is incredibly violent. Yeah, it was really, really bad. Like, every single one of these is just brutal as all hell. Uh-huh. Her daughter, 17-year-old Beverly June Clutt, was on the kitchen floor. Both women had been bludgeoned to death with an axe, and it was determined that an attempt had been made to sexually assault Bertha. Oh. I will say that there wasn't anything besides the fact that, like, the officer said she was lying on the floor and her dress was up. Okay. But there that's wasn't... That's very... Yeah. That's an easy thing to happen in a fight. Right. Exactly. Or even if you're crawling on the ground or something, so... So we don't I'm gonna know hope, for sure. Right. Hopefully not. Yeah. Uh, so it's believed that Jake was trying to rape her, and then Beverly heard her mother's screams and came running. And that's why he had to murder both. So that was the initial thought here. Well, except for he's murdered, like, everybody in his path so yeah, far. Right. Except for the kids, so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Jake was really trying to convince the officers that he was innocent, and he knew who did it. He was like, there was this guy named Leroy, and he actually committed the murders. He said, this Leroy guy picked him up when he arrived in Washington. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. And Jake was such a good liar that some of the officers were fooled by the story. You've got to be kidding me. But 
things changed when Jake's pants were processed and they found brain matter. Oh, okay. So. I really thought you were going to say blood or something. Sure. Brain matter was 1000% not what was in uh-huh. going through my head. Wow. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. <laughs> he eventually confessed to the two murders and said that it was a burglary gone wrong. In his signed confession, he said he entered the Clut residence through the unlocked back door to commit what he called an easy burglary. He brought an axe that he found in a shed just in case somebody tried to bother him. He removed his shoes and snuck into Bertha's room and stole a dollar fifty from her purse. When he went to the kitchen, he says that Bertha was standing behind him. Jake told her he only wanted her money, and then he would grab his shoes and leave. But she grabbed him and they started fighting, and that's when he murdered the two women. He said he believed the policemen were going to shoot him outside, and, and that's, that's why, why he, he ran. attacked. Oh. Yeah, that's why he yeah, attacked I, them. Okay. Yeah, but probably mm -hmm. why he ran at first. Right. Who knows? Yeah. Jake was only charged with one murder on October 31st, 1947, and that was the murder of Bertha Clut. I see your face. Let me explain. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Confusion. Um, okay, so it was customary at this time to only file one charge when there was a case with multiple homicides. What? That way, if they didn't get a conviction on the first offense, you they can file the additional. Again. Yeah, and just keep trying. <gasps> oh, Until okay. one of them sticks. Okay. Uh -huh. All right, all right. At a motion hearing on November 14th, 1957, the defense attorney requested a change of venue, stating that Jake couldn't get a fair trial. He also informed the court that Jake wanted to represent himself. Judge Hodge denied both of these requests. Jury selection took an entire day. Uh, I guess it was tough to make sure that Jake was really going to get a fair trial. And they had to question the jury about, or the jurors, uh, about their beliefs on the death penalty. Some of them had to be rejected for various reasons, but one of them had to go because she was the mother of the deputy prosecutor, which, like, oh. can't do that. Okay. <laughs> and another knew Bertha and Beverly. Oh, my God. That's not going to work. <laughs> Ten potential jurors admitted that they were already influenced by the newspapers and radio. Holy shit. Okay. Yeah. So kind of a shit show going on here the trial lasted a day and a half that's it a day and a half and the prosecuting attorney had the goal of proving that bertha klutz's death was premeditated so that jake could get the death penalty blood and brain tissue from both victims had been found on jake's clothing his bloody fingerprints were in the house and on the axe good lord and his shoes were found in the house. <laughs> so, Sorry. Oh, my God. He did left his shoes in there. Yeah. Oh, man. Sure did. The state introduced a surprise witness, and that was the Tacoma police officer, John Hickey. He said that when he arrived at the scene, he found the suspect covered in blood and two officers were wounded. He handcuffed Jake Bird and entered the house. He saw a young girl in her pajamas lying partially in the doorway of the kitchen and dining room, face down in a pool of blood. He testified that he and Officer Russell Skatum beat Jake Bird while he was in their custody. So John Hickey explained that he lost his temper after viewing the bodies of the two women that were murdered. When they sat in the patrol wagon, he asked Jake why he murdered them, and he said he didn't do it. Well, Leroy did. Oh, good God. 
Jake told the officers that he met Leroy at a pool hall in Tacoma, and he was just there at the house looking around. It was Leroy that committed the murders. He was just looking around. Just looking around. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Holy crap. And... So the officer obviously knew he was lying, so he got pissed, and he hit him in the jaw, which knocked him to the front of the patrol wagon, and then he started beating him with his nightstick. Oh. Once Jake said, don't kill me, the officer, like, realized what he was doing, and he stopped, and they got him to a hospital. Okay, I mean, at least the officer's honest. Right. Yeah. Uh, Officer Hickey said he regretted losing his temper. Can't do that now. Right. (laughs) Right. Oh, boy. Yeah. When the prosecutor moved to enter Jake's signed confession into evidence, the defense objected and said Jake was clearly under duress, so it had to be inadmissible. If he got a beating from an officer prior to the confession... It could be possible that he feared for his life and confessed because he was so scared. The judge was like, listen, there is no correlation between the beating and the confession, so the confession was presented. The jury deliberated for 35 minutes. <laughs> like, okay, 35. They were like, no, we got this. Yeah. Before returning with their verdict. Jake Bird was found guilty of first-degree murder, and on December 6th, 1947, Judge Hodge sentenced him to be hanged. A motion was denied for a new trial. Defense attorney Selden said, quote, I feel whenever any man 45 years old gets an idea that no lives are safe to anyone except his own, that man is a detriment to society and should be obliterated. He also called him a dumb transient. Oh. And the attorney did say that Jake was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he said he believed the brain tissue was on the axe and Jake's pants due to the careless way the police handled the evidence. Okay. So, like, that's his own attorney saying, oh, I want my client obliterated. Yep. Uh, I'm actually shocked that he didn't get a new trial right there. I mean, what year was this? 1947. I'm just saying. I'm I'm just saying. (laughs) I'm just saying. (laughs) Judge Hodge asked Jake Bird if he wanted to comment, and he said, quote, I was given no chance to defend myself. My own lawyers just asked you to hang me. They apologized for defending me. If they were so reluctant to defend me, Why did they contest the prosecutor's proof of murder and now say that everything's proven? Soon after this happened, Jake started confessing to his involvement in a dozen murders that took place over a span of 20 years. He was really trying to get out of the death penalty and said that he was going to tell them about 44 murders that he either committed on his own or participated in. Well, um, this explains why the numbers were so freaking all over the place when yeah, I was researching it. Everywhere. And I will say, you threw out the number 46, and yes, I saw that in a lot of places, too. That's the one I got the most out of yeah. all of them. It, I found the 44 in, like, a history link, so I was like, I'm just gonna take it. But yeah, 44, yeah. 46, somewhere in there. Uh, he even admitted that he murdered Harvey Boyd, even though... Clarence Lucart was already convicted for this. It was later discovered that Jake and Clarence Lucart were friends and served time together. Oh. So when Harvey Boyd's mom was questioned, she said she was absolutely convinced that the correct man was already locked up for the murder of her child. And it looks like Jake might have been trying to do his friend a favor by taking the fall for a murder because he already knew he was going to be hanged. I mean, okay. Right. He doesn't seem like a nice guy, so. (laughs) Yeah, true. (laughs) Uh, His confessions were compiled into a 174-page report for the governor's office. That's a lot. A lot of pages of confessions. Governor Walgren granted Jake a 60-day reprieve so that he had extra time to clear up the 44 murders he's confessing to. 
Of the 44 or 46 confessed murders, only 11 were substantiated, but apparently Jake had more than enough knowledge about the other murders to become the prime suspect. Okay. Yeah. This explains so much. Right. (laughs) Our stories are all tying together. (laughs) During his travels, Jake had murdered people, mostly women, in Illinois, Kentucky, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, and Washington. Holy hell. I was losing my voice there. While Jake had some extra time, he appealed his conviction to the Washington State Supreme Court. He argued that Judge Hodge made several judicial errors and demanded that he get a new trial. On November 30th, 1948, his final petition to the state for a retrial was denied. His new attorney made several attempts to get a stay of execution, but the motion was denied and the court refused to review the petitions. He spent his final days talking about a small black box that contained money from burglaries, and the box was with a friend in Louisiana, but he never said who. He wrote a 20-page memoir, gave it to his attorney, and said it could be released after his death. Part of the writings were disclosed, but a lot of it, I guess, was things that already came out during the trial. On July 14, 1949, Jake Bird ate his last meal on death row and talked with his attorney for two hours. There were 125 people who gathered around the gallows and a prison chaplain read a letter from Jake that said he bore no malice toward anyone and sought forgiveness. The chaplain wasn't even finished reading the note when the trap door opened (gasps) and Jake dropped through. What? Which I don't know if that was an error or if they were just done with his words. I have no idea. But yeah, he's not even done. And the trap door opened. Well, that's because he done went and fucking cursed everybody. He did. (laughs) (laughs) They were just done. They're like, screw you. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think it's funny that he's like, you know, saying he bore no malice toward anyone. Um, yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, because you freaking cursed everyone. Yeah. I can't I, I can't remember the number, but I think it was like six people died that were tied to his case within yeah. a year. Yeah. So, yeah, you did. <laughs> uh, he was hanged at 1220 a.m. on July 15th, 1949. He was buried in an unmarked grave in the prison cemetery at Walla Walla Correctional Center. So, what is it? Walla Walla. That's amazing. So I was talking about Potawatomi and you're talking about Walla Walla? Walla. Walla. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this keeps getting better. Uh, his grave was marked with his prison number, 21520. Oh, Which damn. I think is really it's rude. It's cold for sure. Yeah. Not sure why we gave him a number and not a name, but maybe there's a reason. Uh, Jake wrote in his memoir, I feel all my appeals have been successful because the students of the future will ask why the questions were not answered. I don't know exactly what he's saying there, but if he's saying that he didn't get a fair trial, I actually agree. But I mean... I'm just saying. Does it matter? Because either way, we ended up where he yeah. was going to end up. So Right, right, right. I mean, his own lawyer, like I said said he should be obliterated, yeah. and he wasn't allowed to say anything to defend himself at the trial, I guess. So I'm not saying he didn't commit the murders, but there are right. odd things no, that I have don't. happened. Yeah, for sure. Uh, also, I did find this really strange, and I know this may be something that was different back then. So the murders took place on October 30th, 1947, and Jake was charged the very next day. The trial lasted a day and a half. The jury deliberated 35 minutes, and he was sentenced on December 6th, 1947. So, like, how on earth could you gather all the information you need for the trial in a month? Yeah. Like, whoa. But again, I know. Yeah. Could have been something back then, but I kind of feel like 
this was expedited in a weird way. It might have been, yeah. And then he was denied a retrial, but it seems that he should have gotten one after what his lawyer did. Right. Uh, Jake Bird did gain a bit of fame and was known as the jailhouse lawyer because he often argued his own case before the court. He had knowledge of the law, and people that were against the death penalty did try to help him, too. He was able to delay his execution by a year and a half. Even though he confessed to at least 44 murders, this case did not capture the attention of the national press, but history marks him as one of the nation's most prolific serial killers. It's crazy, yeah, because I, when I when I saw him, like, I, or when I just, like, saw it in the research I was doing, I was really shocked because I feel like I definitely have heard the name, like, Tacoma Axe Killer before, but I didn't know a single thing about him when I started that story. I've never heard this story until you brought it up. Yeah, I have definitely, and I did not know Jake Bird is the name for sure. Like, I had no yeah. idea. Mm-hmm. And then here's your favorite part. When Jake was being the sentenced, the curse, Yes, <laughs> he said, I'm putting the hex of Jake Bird on all of you who had anything to do with my being punished. Mark my words. You will die before I do. And of course, nobody paid attention to this at first. Uh, five men that were connected to the trial died within a year. And that was Edward D. Hodge, Pierce County Superior Court Judge, age 69, died January 1st, 1948. Joseph E. Karpik, Karpach? Sure. Pierce County Undersheriff, age 46, died April 5th, 1948. George L. Harrigan, Pierce County Court Reporter, age 69, died June 11th, 1948. Sherman Lyons, the officer who recorded Jake's confession, died October 28, 1948. James W. Selden, defense attorney, age 76, died on November 26, 1948. According to the Tacoma News Tribune, all of the men died from heart attacks. So that's Whoa, really weird. Oh, I did not know that part. Really weird that they all died the same way. A sixth man, Arthur Stewart, who was a prison guard assigned to death row, died of pneumonia two months before Jake's execution. Holy crap. So that one's kind of also lumped in there. It was reported that Jake even put a few hexes on some of the prisoners. What? Uh-huh. A local paper printed stories about the hexes, and a few of the prisoners supposedly died after Jake hexed them. Things didn't stop there either. Like Hannah said in her story, Mr. and Mrs. Stribling, they were the ones attacked in their home with an axe. Well, I guess a lot of these were, so that doesn't <laughs> narrow it down. Uh, but both survived. They were and, the survivors. There yes, go. they were the survivors. And there was some controversy about whether Jake was the one that did it or not. Well, years later, Mr. Stribling shot his wife in the head, then shot himself. And uh, Hannah brought that up, too. So she ended up surviving and he did not. Some people do believe that that's part of the Jake Bird curse because they were the ones that you they know, the said, survivors, yeah. Yeah, and they said it was him, and he got convicted for that. Yep. Uh, it's believed that Jake might have some sort of supernatural power since he was able to hex so many people. Uh, either way, whether you believe in the hex or not, it is really strange it that he really says weird. it, the words come out his mouth, and then people die. It is really weird. Like, a lot. I know it. If it was like one or two, I'd be like, okay. No, I know, but it was, but I mean, that's, that's a decent amount. Many. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot of people tied to the case. Um, so I guess one of the things I wanted to bring up with that is like, if he was truly hexing and was hexing people in jail, that might be why his ass is haunting Squirrel Cage so hard. No, it would make complete sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, because it's any yeah, and they say that like if you mess with his cell, uh -huh. that a lot of times is when he 
you start seeing things because he starts coming out because he's pissed off. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it would make a lot of sense. And he did spend a decent amount of time there. Mm -hmm. Um, And given the energy that he has, I feel like it's definitely easily something that could be left behind there. Yeah. So... So that's it. No, I'm just really excited that you covered that because, like, I was I could hardly take it as I was researching Squirrel Cage because, <laughs> like, he kept coming up and I, yeah, it was just so difficult because I wanted to know his story too, but I didn't want to mix the two stories up. I know, so I couldn't really look at anything that had to do with him. Well, it's funny because during your story, you kept going, and this ties back to Jake Bird, and he'll come up again. <laughs> oh my god, and that's so I was awesome! Like, that's it. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> We coordinated. That was super cool. <laughs> that was super cool. We should uh, do this again. <laughs> yeah. It was actually fun to um, get the spooky side of things and then actually tell the story. Yeah. So No. Yeah. Let's do this again. Okay. Okay. Deal. <laughs> All right, so make sure to follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, bye. bye.